try to collect items for our mission yard sale, which is July 8th. And so starting this Sunday, uh, following this week, and then also next week, we are collecting items for that mission yard sale. So if you have anything that uh, you'd like to donate for that yard sale, um, just call the office, church office, or give me a call on my cell, which is in the bulletin, and just let us know what you have you'd like to donate. Um, this is to help uh, fund some people that are going on the missions trip and some, some other people that are going. And so, again, if, if you have anything that you don't need around your house that you kind of want to clear out the space and, and like to donate for the, the, the missions yard sale, um, just let the office know. Uh, we can pick it up if it's large. If it's a small item, you want to bring it in. That helps also. And uh, we have some group that Sunday school classrooms inside the educational wing um, uh, designated for that. And so again, we just uh, we thank you for the donations that we've already received, and thank you for the donations that we're going to receive. And we also welcome the help on July 8th for that yard sale. Um, we need uh, all hands on deck for that, so if you're able to help on July 8th um, for that, we appreciate that. Again, just uh, let me, um, or uh, I need know if you're able to help or anything you need to pick up for that. Um, so I appreciate that. And then um, also, we just want to remind you, uh, Children's Camp is coming up, and so uh, if some of you guys are learning a little late because you're getting your, you got your portraits made today, and I know some more of you will be getting your portraits made after church uh, with the Children's Ministry, and so we, we thank you for, for encouraging and helping out the Children's Ministry with that um, to help kids to get to camp, and so we just we thank you for that, and uh, want to, again, uh, we thank you for that, again, um, it's, camp is a really important thing, and we, we, as we look at those kids uh, sending them to camp, and you know, we send them off to te children's camp, we send them off to teen camp, there's a strong importance for it. That's a time in their life that they can get away from all the distractions of life and focus on God. And so we thank you for that. And so we, we thank you for your financial contributions to help out. We thank you for the prayer, which is more important. The financial is important, thank you for that, but uh, prayer is more important and uh, the discipleship that you guys are taking an interest in our, our children and our youth is important too, so we thank you for that. So before we get started, uh, let me just ask, let us stand and bow our heads and pray and get started in a time of worshiping God. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for these people that are here. Lord, I ask that you just be with those that are traveling on vacations and getting some R&R. &R. Lord, I ask that you bless this time as we come to you and worship you. I ask that you pour out your spirit on this place. You pour out your presence on us, Lord. Help us to push out all the distractions of this world, Lord. Help us to focus on you and worship you, for you are truly an amazing God. We thank you for that. In your glorious name, Father, we pray to this. Amen. Remain standing as we uh, sing, Thank You, Lord. Uh, what a wonderful way to open up a service.
Choose the light. 
Hallelujah. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you today, Lord. Be blessed, your name. Be glorified. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done. For everything that you've done in our life. In our church. In our family. We lift up your name, Father God. All glory, God, is to you. Every praise, Lord, is to you, Lord. We bless your name. This one we hear today, Father God, is because our chains are gone. It's because, Lord, you forgive our sin, Lord. It's because you set us free, Father God. We bless your name. Thank you, God, for all you do, Lord. Because you are the great God. You are our Savior. You are the powerful God. That's why we worship you today. That's why we praise you, Lord. You are the Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end, Lord. All the earth. And your word said, Lord, all knees shall bow before you, Lord, before your name. Thank you, God. Like we sing today, Father God. Thank you, Lord. That's all we can do. That's all we can offer to you, Father God. You deserve our praise. You deserve our glory, God. You deserve our life. Thank you, God, for set us free. Thank you, Lord. And we pray today, Lord, for our congregation. You know the needs, Lord. And we pray that you work your miracle today, Lord. Every need, Lord, you know them. And I pray that you will touch them, Father God. Those who need them. Uh, a miracle, those who need a healing, those who need, Father God, joy, peace in the life, Lord. We trust you for a miracle today. We trust you, Father God, for healing today. We trust you, Father God, for peace, for joy, Lord. We trust you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the praise to you, Lord. That's why you're looking for the real worshiper, Father God, who worship you, Lord, in, in the truth. Thank you, God, for each one of us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this precious moment, Father God. We're able to gather in your presence, Lord. We, we just want to thank you for your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord, that's all we need. We desperate need of your presence, Father God. And we realize that, Lord, we cannot do it without your presence. That's what you said, Lord. John 15, 5. Lord, we cannot do it apart from you. We do need your presence, Lord. And I pray that you would release your presence among us today, Father God. Because without your presence, Lord, we cannot be effective, Father God, in your presence, Lord. So we need your presence, Lord. We need your presence because when your presence among us, Lord, we're not going to pray in vain, Father God. We're not going to pray in vain, Lord. When we pray, Lord, you know, something going to happen. When we pray, Father God, we will find healing, we will find peace, we will find joy, Lord, in your presence, Lord. Thank you, God, for the whole church. We pray for the youth, Lord. We pray for the, um, the, the, the nursery, the kids, Lord. The sound system, Father God. We pray, Lord. Heavenly Father, pray for, pray for, pray for Pastor Mark today. And his wife, Mr. Sabbath. Now pray that you would touch us, Lord. 
Use us, Father God. Thank you, Lord, for all you do, Father God. And I also pray for Pastor Moses, Father God, who's gonna about to, uh, to, to um, bring to us your word, Lord. And I pray that you would use him, Father God, in a powerful way, Lord. So, Father God, we're not gonna hear from a man today, but hear from you today, Father God, because we 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 so need to hear from you, Father God. Use him, Father God. Use each one of us, Father God. Use the church, Lord. May everything that we've done, Lord, bring glory to you. Only bring glory to you, Father God. Use us, Lord. Use us. Use the church, Lord. Use the preaching, the choir, um, sound system, every patient in the church, the office, Lord. Use us, Father God. Just for your glory, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This time I'd like to ask for our shirts to come up. And as they're coming up, I just like to remind you that today is uh, World Mission Broadcast Sunday. And I just want to encourage you to, to help support that with these with our offerings to be able to support these broadcasts. People lives were changed. Last year I, I told you a story of a young woman on the verge of just giving up on life. And watching a little show, a seven, The 700 Club, changed her entire life. And that allowed her to give her heart to Christ. And God gave her joy and changed her life, changed her family's life, allowed her to have a family and have a son who was a minister, which is me. Um, and I don't, and if those of you didn't realize, this is my mom right here, by the way. Um, Somebody donated and gave money so that the 700 Club could be on TV. So that a young woman who was lost in despair could see what Jesus could do for her life. And it changed her whole family tree. My little, beautiful little baby girl wouldn't be here if it wasn't people like that stepping out in the faith and doing what the Lord was putting on their heart. And so I just want to encourage you, if the Lord's putting that call on your heart to do that, please do that, because you could be changing somebody's life. Somebody could, in 20, 30 years from now, could be alive because of the money that you donate. And the amount of money that you're donating, when you look at it, that it can maybe go and take you out to dinner, and then you look at someone could be alive, that dinner's really not that important, is it? So I just want to encourage you, if God's asking you to do it, to do it. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for these people that are here who are faithful. Lord, I ask that you be with us now as we take these morning tithes and these offerings. Lord, I thank you for those people, whoever it was that donated that money to allow to have that program on so that my mom's life could be changed, so that I could be born so that I can hold a little dear angel in my hands. So Lord, I just ask that you bless these tithes and these offerings today. I ask that you bless these people that are listening to you, and that are stepping out in the faith, and that are doing what you're asking them to do, Lord. Lord, I thank you for giving us wisdom and helping us as a church body to do what you're asking us to do for your kingdom, and being wise with what you're giving us. In your name we pray these things, Father. Amen.
They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Enoch come from the Nephilim. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and they look at, they look at us the same. Let's pray. Oh Lord, I, I thank you for this day. I thank you for these people that are here. Lord, I ask that you speak to us now through your word. I ask that you re reveal to us what you have for us to learn today. Lord, I ask that you pour out your presence on us. And I ask that you help me to get out of the way so that you may speak. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The title of today's sermon is Keeping the Faith. The Israelites are in the desert, and they're right there. They're right on the goal line. Can you imagine how, how it would be to be Caleb and to be Joshua? At this time, Joshua and Caleb are about 40 years old. So their entire lives, they've been hearing about the promised land. The promise that God had promised them. The entire time, them living in Egypt, in slavery, they've heard about this. They've heard about the land that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, to Jacob. This land that, that is promised to them. And so for 40 years, they lived in Egypt as slaves, praying for the day that God would deliver them from Egypt. So that they could go take possession of the land that God had given them. And so here it is, Caleb and Joshua, they're there. Forty years of their life in slavery. And Moses comes back. Now remember Moses was there for 40 years in Egypt. Then he was gone for 40 years in the desert while God was correcting him. Then he comes back at the ripe young age of 80 to lead God's people out of Egypt. And so over a time, period of time, they saw God move. They saw God move and, and free them from Egypt. They saw the plagues. They saw, they saw the Egyptian people's hearts get hardened, hardened and hardened and God do greater and greater and greater things. To the point that they finally gave up and the Egyptians said, just go. And about two and a half million people were freed. And they went out into the desert to go find that promised land. And so they go out into that desert. And the Bible says that by day, there was a pillar, there was a cloud that protected them. And by night, a pillar of fire. And so they saw this. They continued and, and saw the sea split in half where they could walk through dry land so that they weren't killed by the Egyptian army. And that God collapsed the sea on the Egyptian army so that there would be no worry about it anymore. They saw all this. They were there at Mount Sinai, right? They were there when they saw the, the mountain trembling and the presence of God coming down on that mountain. They were there. They saw that. They saw all of that. And so just imagine to be one of the 12 that's chosen. For Moses to come up to you and say, hey, I'm sending 12 spies into the land. We're here. We're right here. We're right on the border. I'm sending 12 spies, one from each of the tribes of Israel, to go into the land for 40 days and see what it looks like. Let us know what the land looks like. Let us know how it is set up. And so Joshua and Caleb get sent with these 10 other guys. And so for 40 days, they're going through the land. They go through there and they they spy and, and they see if the land is, is fertile. And they find out that the, the soil's great. It's perfect. They go to see if there's trees. There's plenty of trees and lumber. 
so that they can build things. They can grow things. The land is, is good so that they can have cattle. They can have animals. The sea is good so that they can have to go fishing. And that the land is exactly the way the Lord said it would be. That it was a land flowing with milk and honey. Now this is always the part where I always say, not literally flowing with milk and honey, because teenagers go, how, do, how does it flow? Like, I've never seen milk flow from a river. That's just that part when they always, I always have to like clarify for them. But it was a land that was fertile, right? It was a land that they had cattle that could grow there and, 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 and be raised there and plants that could grow there and that a, a nation could grow and be there. And so 40 days, they explore the land. They explore the land for 40 days and see that everything that God promised the land would be, it was. It says that they go and they find grapes because Moses said, bring back some of the fruit that's there growing so we can see what does grow there. And so they bring back a cluster of grapes that's so big that two men have to carry it. Now, I'm no, uh, like, grape experts. Like, when I buy my grapes, they come like a little bag from, uh, you know, the grocery store. And so it's possible that they grow in a large cluster like that regularly. I don't know because I'm not, I don't do that. I mean, like... Spanish, so we, we grow like banana plants and stuff, so we don't grow grapes. And, but nonetheless, a grain cluster that two men have to carry to me seems like a heavy thing, and that seems ridiculous. And they find these great grapes and pomegranates and all this good stuff. And so for 40 days, they're seeing that the land is exactly the way the Lord said it was. That sure, there's people there. And they're strong. But the land is exactly the way that God said it is. So the 40 days are up and they come back. They come back and they come in front of the entire Israelite community. In front of Moses and Aaron. And these 12 guys come to give a report. And they tell them all the good things. The land truly is flowing with milk and honey. The land is amazing. The land has... Has, has all this stuff that we can do. You know, we can, we can grow food there. We can raise cattle there. We can, we can have sh flocks and, and all this stuff that we can do here. The land is amazing. But. But. The cities are strong. They're fortified. The people are big. And scary. We can't do it. I can just imagine Caleb and Joshua during that 40 days were probably trying to encourage them that entire time. Like, don't worry about it, guys. Guys, yeah, sure, they're strong, but do you remember what God has done for us, right? You remember how the Lord has worked with us? We got this. And so they get there thinking, okay, we're going to give this great report, and we're going to do this. And they say, but... The people are strong, their cities are fortified, and they're giants. They're big and scary, and I don't want anything to do with them. Now, just like I showed you guys to so imagine what it would be to be Caleb and Joshua, these other ten guys were there too. They saw the same thing. They saw God move time and time again. They saw him move time and time again and free and save his people. And a little roadblock comes and they become scared. And the rest of the Israelite community, instead of saying, hey guys, you guys are afraid and, and scared, that's okay, but we're going to trust in God because we've seen it too. We've seen what God can do. They don't. Just imagine being Caleb, right? They're mid talk, right? And Caleb stops them. He goes, no, 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 stop right there. Okay, yeah, they're strong, they're big, their walls are fortified, but if God is with us and God's giving us this land, we're fine. Guys, remember, this is the God that he split the sea. This is the God that, that freed us from the most powerful nation on the planet. This is the God that, that, 
we're his chosen people. He's promised us this land. This is our land. Right? Guys, guys, you've got to listen to me. Listen, we can do this. But they wouldn't hear it. They wouldn't hear it. And it says that the ten spread fear among the camps. Just imagine being Caleb and Joshua. I would imagine them being out there. I bet Joshua and Caleb were like choosing where they were going to live. Right? Like, they're the first ones to get on the land, right? It's like when teenagers always call shotgun. Like, whoever sits apart for a shotgun. And that's when you get the front seat. I mean, I think all of us know that, but just in case. Right? Like, like I think that was that. Like, like Josh was like, shotgun, that's my, that's my mountain. That's my mountain. I called it. I'm going to put a sign there. I want that one. Same with Caleb. Like, like, that's where I'm going to build my house. Like, that's where I'm going to build my house. And that's where I'm going to have my little farm. Like, they were planning what they were going to do in the land already. Because in their mind, the battles that were to come were nothing. Because they knew that the, their Father in Heaven had already taken care of it. That sure, they had to put in effort, and sure, they had to work. But if God had promised it to them, if it was their promised land, that they were going to get it. But the rest of the people got afraid. The rest of the people got fearful. Some of us feel that way. We feel like the Lord has, has promised something to us. Or given us a vision of the church. Or maybe it's our family. The Lord may be giving you a vision or a promise that your children would be saved one day. That Naples first would be growing and, and changing in different ways. That Naples itself would be growing in, for the Lord in different ways. And you were like Caleb and Joshua. Like, let's do this. God is here with us. Let's do this. And it didn't happen. Because fear crept in. Fear crept in into the families, into our churches, into our lives. And we look at this and we go, well, what do we do? Do we get angry? Do we take our ball and go home? Do we find a church that's gonna to listen to us? Do we move to a different town? Do we find a new family? Which is probably the worst of all of them, right? What do we do? I think the response that Caleb and Joshua and Moses and Aaron have is perfect. In chapter 14, verses 5 through 10. Then Moses and Aaron fell down on their face in front of the entire Israelite assembly. They fell on their face in front of everybody that was gathered there. These people that were there were talking about stoning them. Fear crept in into the, the hearts of the Israelite people. And they started mumbling and grumbling and complaining and saying, we should have stayed in, in Egypt. We should have stayed in Egypt. We, we could. They brought us out here to die. They brought us out here to die for, for us to be killed in war, for our wives and our kids to be taken off as plunder. We should have stayed in Egypt. Real quickly, they're forgetting about how they've been freed from chains of bondage. And they're yearning to go back to those chains of bondage. They've quickly forgotten what God has done for them. And Moses and Aaron, Joshua and Caleb, don't get mad. They don't say forget it. They don't say, I'm going home. I'm taking my family and I'm going in there without you. They fall on their hands and their face. Because they fell on their face in front of the whole Israel assembly that was gathered there. Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, 
and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because he, we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the whole Israelite assembly talked about stoning them. Their response was to humble themselves in front of the entire assembly. To beg and plead with them. Not to do it for them, but to not rebel against God. They were trying to reason with them. Not so that they could go get the house on a mountain. Not so that they could have that 40 acres and a farm. Because they didn't want them to rebel against the Lord. Because they loved them so much, they didn't want them to rebel. And so they humbled themselves in front of the entire Israelite assembly, begging them to reconsider and to not rebel against God. That's the response. That's the response to their dreams being crushed. That's the response to being so close to getting something, being so close to realizing a dream, being so close to seeing a vision that God had given to them, being fulfilled and being torn away from them. Their response was to love on them and to humble themselves in front of God in them. That was their response. And it says that the whole Israelite assembly just started talking about stoning them. They were so sure that they were wrong, they're like, let's just kill them, get them a leader, and go back to Egypt. Because fear had crept into their heart. But then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all of Israel. Then God showed up. The Lord showed up. And they took notice. The Lord showed up, and then Israelites, the Israelites took notice. And what ends up happening is the Israelites, God goes, that's it, I'm done. And he says to Moses, I'm just going to wipe them off the face of the earth. Like I've done time after time again, I've tried to help these people. You know, I love them. They're my people. I've tried time and time again to bring them out of this life of sin, out of this life of bondage, and they don't want to have it. And so Moses, I'm going to start over with you. What would have been the easiest thing for Moses to say? All right, let's do this. Let's just start all over. Uh, but Lord, I'm, you know, in my 80s right now, so uh, I'm going to need like another 100 years if you want to start over with me. But he doesn't. Moses begs and pleads for the Israelite people. He begs for them. And pleads with God for them. And God forgives them. But the thing is, even though that God forgave them, there was still a consequence to their rebellion. Church, the Lord will forgive you of your sins if you ask for forgiveness. But I always tell this to the teens, just because you ask for forgiveness of your sins, it doesn't always mean that the consequences of your sins go away instantly. Sometimes it means we will have to live through the consequences of the sins that we have in our life. It doesn't mean that the Lord doesn't love us. It doesn't mean that the Lord hasn't forgiven us of those sins. It just means that there's consequences to our actions. And so there the Israelites sit. And God gives them consequences and says, not one of you guys are going to see that promised land. You can see it from the mountaintop. You can see it right there. It's right there. You're so close, but you're never going to step foot on it. And for 40 years, they wander through the desert. For 40 years, they have to live out a life of punishment for disobeying God. Just imagine Caleb and Joshua, though. Like, they listened to God, right? They were there. They, they're like, let's do this. We trust in God. We, we love God. We're, 
We're, we're trusting in Him. We're keeping faith in the Lord. But they are going to be with them. And so the Lord says, Caleb and Joshua, even though you're going to be for 40 years in the wilderness too, you will see the land. You'll be able to get to see the land. You're going to have to live through this, these consequences with them. But you will get to see the land. The rest won't, but you guys will. Because you trusted in me. They don't get mad. They don't start you know, yelling at the rest. You know, all right, well, this is what it is. What it is. This means I gotta wait a little bit longer to see this dream. This means I gotta guarantee another 40 years, right? Church, like I said, some of us have, have, have feel kind of like that way. We feel that God has given us a vision for our families, for our church, for our friends. And we feel kind of lost. We feel like we've begged and pleaded. And we don't know what to do. I want to encourage you to keep the faith. To keep trusting in that vision and in that dream, that promise that the Lord has given you. It may have not come true yet. The Lord may, may have given you that dream 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. But He is a Lord that comes through on His promises. Sometimes we have to wait a little bit longer due to our own disobedience. It may not have to do anything with us. We may be paying for the consequences of others. But we don't get mad at those others. We don't blame others. We ask God how can we work to do what he's asking us to do. Joshua and Caleb don't go and say, all right, I'm going to blame the rest of this, the Israelite assembly. I'm going to blame them for 40 years. No, they just get back to work. They get back to doing what God's asking them to do. For 40 years, they get back to work and do what they're doing. Talk about keeping the faith. Their first 40 years, they were dreaming of it. To get so close to a dream, so close to taste it, to be there, and to have it pulled away from you. And not anything that you did. It's frustrating. But they didn't give up. They kept the faith. They trusted in the Lord. They knew it may not happen now, but it'll happen. I might have to wait another 40 years, but it's going to happen. I want to encourage you, church. Some of you have been waiting years for what God has promised. Don't give up. Don't give up on what the Lord has for you. Don't give up on what He has for your family. Don't give up on what He has for Naples. Naples first. I know some of us are looking at it like, well, I've done my part, I'm tired. I understand that. I haven't slept in a while. <laughs> I understand that. But if the Lord in heaven has given you a vision, and giving you a promise. Hold on to that. Keep holding on to that. Keep putting your faith in the Lord. Trusting in the Lord. And asking Him how He'll use you to further that goal. How He's asking you to further that goal. Next week we're going to continue and read a little bit further into the life of Caleb and Joshua. And see what happens in their life after that 40 years. To see if they hold on to it and what happens. But before we close, keep the faith. You guys are prayer warriors. I know you are. This is a church that prays, and I feel the prayers. I know Pastor Mark feels those prayers. Keep praying. Keep trusting in the Lord. The Lord has some great things he has for this church. For Naples first. For Naples for your families, for our friends. 
The Lord is there. We just need to keep pushing. When you get tiredest, that's when usually you're right there, right at the edge, right at that barrier. Keep pushing. Keep putting your faith in the Lord and asking God for that strength and asking God what you can do for Him. Let's bow our heads. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for these people that are here. Lord, as we've learned from the life of uh, Joshua and Caleb, Lord, Lord, I ask that you help us to continue to hold on to you, Lord. I ask that you continue to refresh that dream, that vision that you've given us. Renew that in our heart so that we know what you're asking us to do. Lord, I ask that you give us encouragement as we've become discouraged over time on what you'd have us to do for your kingdom, Lord, on what you want to be done for, for your kingdom. I ask that you give us an encouragement, Lord. I ask that you help us to build our faith, and I ask that you help us to, to keep our faith in you, to keep trusting in you through the hard times, through the long times, through all of it. Lord, I ask as we leave this building, Lord, I ask you to help us be your people. I ask you to help us be you to this generation. I ask that you help us to go speak to those that are younger and older than us about your love. I ask that you help us to, to do life together with people, Lord. When I was at camp last week, I was talking to one of the speakers, and, and he, he brought something up a lot. That's, he brought something up, Lord. Christianity isn't taught. It's caught. So, Lord, I ask that you help us to live life and be you to this generation and to our families and to our friends so that they can catch what it is to, to love you what it is to be you. I ask that you just give us a new fire in our heart and renew it. Give us a new strength and a new energy to do the things that you're asking us to do, Lord, for your kingdom. In your name we pray these things, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.